Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the America House Virtual Floor. My name is Lucy Zoria, and I'm the program manager here at America House in Kiev, Ukraine. Spooky season is upon us, and right now at America House, we are celebrating a week of horrors. And who better than to talk to than to Heather Langenkamp herself, the ultimate final girl, Nancy Thompson from from Nightmare on Elm Street. Today, she is here with us to talk about her film, I Am Nancy, but also much, much more about her Hollywood journey of more than 40 years. So welcome, Nancy, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, thank you for having me. It's so exciting because Nightmare on Elm, on Elm Street was such a cultural phenomena here in Ukraine. I Probably you weren't aware of that, really. <laughs> no, I know in some countries, you know, it was, delayed in its showing because many countries banned it when it was first uh, released in 1984. And I haven't done extensive traveling, so I don't know how many fans I have in uh, different parts of the world. I find it, I found it so fascinating in your film, I Am Nancy, that you got the chance to travel and really speak with fans from all over the world and all over Europe as well. And um, it was really touching to see you interacting with them and them showing kind of their appreciation for that. So how was that process for you really? And what really inspired you to shoot I Am Nancy? The inspiration actually came one day when I was at work at um, AFX Studio, which is the makeup effects studio I, I run with my husband, David Anderson. And I had just made a simple phone call to Wes Craven's uh, office. I actually wanted to attend a movie with him that was showing in Los Angeles. And when I talked to his secretary, I said, this is Heather Langenkamp and I would like to leave a message for Wes Craven. And she said, who, what's your name? Could you spell that for me, please? And this was a good, you know, 25 years or, you know, so after we had made Nightmare on Elm Street and I thought, wow, I just felt like after so much time, you know, Heather Langenkamp as Nancy Thompson was not very well known, even though this was Wes Craven's secretary. So my, so my sister-in-law who was working with me at the time, she was infuriated and she said, we have to correct this situation. You know, Nancy is such an important character and she's the reason Nightmare on Elm Street is so popular and you have fans all over the world. Let's make a documentary about this. And she and I both teamed up and we went to five cities. We went to um, Germany, Essen, Germany. We went to London, UK and Hartford, Connecticut and Los Angeles, California. And um, one more place like a new a city in New Jersey. And we took a camera with us and just filmed my interactions with my fans and we asked, you know, I kind of asked my fans questions about how, you know, how they came to know about Nightmare on Elm Street and what importance it had in their life. And I was actually really stunned by the very, you know, very heartfelt answers that I got from many, many of my fans. And not just answers about how they had enjoyed the movie, but how my character had helped them cope with difficult parts of their life where they had to face something really frightening. So there are people who had to face uh, terrible accidents, a terrible car accident, or uh, mental illness, or bullying, or even some had had terrible experiences like being raped even. So things that were so horrifying to me, but these folks had associated their suffering with Nancy's suffering and I found it very touching. And then I suddenly felt this great responsibility to 
honor my character Nancy in a way that would um, throw even more kind of reverence on this idea of the final girl and this uh, notion that we can all face our fears when we, you know, face our fears like Nancy did. So that's the inspiration for the movie. Thank you so much, Heather. I I personally found the film so funny and also so touching, but also incredibly thoughtful on just how you approach the subject and how you explored all of the different facets, you know, of course of Nancy, but also the film in general. And I know that for some people, you know, Freddy Krueger is this main, main um, image yes, my little baby. from the movie. Yes, little <laughs> Freddy. And that's, that's kind of one of the things that you talk about is that, you know, why is everyone so obsessed with Freddy? Why not Nancy? Because she is, I, I think you mentioned that Freddy is actually in the movie for like six minutes. Is that correct? Total? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's very little time. And, you know, it, I, I think about it a lot. Like, why does our present culture revere the monsters and the horrible people? And why does it, you know, why do we revere these absolutely despicable you know characters why does it give us such pleasure to watch them you know in this case of horror movies kill people mm -hmm. and why have we pretty much given up on heroes and heroes even are mocked and very few people actually find a hero to look up to like maybe we did as kids i mean mm -hmm. i mean i know people have people that they admire but this idea of, of heroes coming in to save the day and like right the wrongs is almost like a quaint, you know, naive concept now. Like almost mm -hmm. things are maybe unsolvable. And that pessimism, I think, leads to this condition of people like Nancy, who are these heroines, um, having a hard time getting uh, the attention of popular culture. Yeah. Um I think the term final girl isn't really known here in Ukraine specifically. Could you describe that a little bit? What is a final girl? Yeah, this is a, a term that was actually applied to the this, uh, I think you call it a stereotype now, but uh, a girl in a film, a horror film especially, who is the final one to survive and who has a a special amount of courage and bravery and uh, she uses her brain and she doesn't just succumb to, you know, the evil character immediately. And she's, she does not have a victim mentality. She has the opposite of that, that she really mm -hmm. believes that she can fight. So that's this term that was coined in the nineties, really people wrote theses uh, for college about it and, it became now it is the cliche. I mean, I would I would argue that it would be hard to find a horror movie that didn't have this character who, you know, kind of it can be a boy or a girl, by the way, I think, because a lot mm -hmm. of movies have this character that lives until the end and uses all their brains to to outsmart the evil character. Mm hmm. It's so interesting to actually think about how Nancy and the film in general was ahead of this, ahead of its time in many ways. You did the film in 2009, but at that point, you know, through the 90s, I remember growing up and Buffy the Vampire Slayer right. was like my idol. And I think right. this is the type of ca a character that really came to the forefront. And I'm wondering, you know, you did this movie back then, but looking even, you know, now 10 years later, do you think that the cultural landscape has changed in terms of just appreciating these types of heroines more? Well, in 2009, I would say when I made the film, I could sense that there was a change happening there. This idea of Nancy as a final girl was already well established, but I just found that women in particular and a lot of gay men actually too, would come up to me and say how like important Nancy was to them. And when I heard that, and I saw many more women being becoming involved in the horror industry, there were more mm -hmm. women writers, directors, there were more people giving women a, a voice in Hollywood generally. 
I think they all, you know, came together and, you know, making that film, the the wit and the the funny, the the sense of humor that the film has, I have to really give credit to my sister-in-law, Arlene Marischal, who is my husband's sister. She had such an ear for the dialogue that was just happening around us in these convention settings. In the, you know, she would take the cameraman around and they would interview people and she would remember every little snippet of conversation she had that was very funny and and that's what she put together and so a lot of this incredible editing that you see in the film she did and the dialogue that is put together she did the irony you know we came together and we we really wanted to make something that people would laugh and enjoy at the same time with this very strong message mm -hmm. and the structure where we started with the tattoo parlor and then moved into kind of uh, you know, this final ending where we really go deep with one particular fan who's very moving in her story. Mm -hmm. That was really my idea and that, and my interview with Wes really helped with that. You mentioned a little bit about the humor, I mean, in I'm Nancy, but we actually have a, we have quite a few questions coming in. Yeah, I see. <laughs> yeah. And okay. uh, let's go to Philip's question. So the first movie was quite dark and Freddie is a pretty serious character in the first film. What do you think about the humor, mostly corny, that came later in the franchise? Well, you know, the influence of Wes Craven is, is, is so important in the first, the third, and the seventh installment of Nightmare on Elm Street. And those scripts are much more serious. You, the problems of the teenagers are really much more dire. And, um, you know, the first movie you have Nancy and her friends, the third movie you have the kids at a suicide, um, at like a, at a suicide ward of a mental hospital. And then the seventh movie, you see me trying to keep alive and keep my son from Freddie's grip. So those were very serious. When uh, the producer went outside of Wes Craven's influence and got new writers and new directors to become involved, Freddie took this turn into being a very like comedic character mm -hmm. um, where there was much more just gags that were, you know, really, they were kind of funny, but they were also really morbid and dark and twisted. And that was, you know, that was also a product of the times. I just think mm -hmm. Freddie became this, he became kind of this like a, I don't know, night, I, I was thinking like late night TV talk show host kind of character. I mean, he always has like a witty comeback and he, he always is trying to up himself and, and humiliate the kids in this way when he kills them. And um, yeah, it just, it was just the way that the people loved him that way. You know, he was doing a lot of, it was a lot of successful movies that had him that way. But Wes Craven always, um, I think, was a little mm -hmm. bit, you know, not disturbed by it, but I don't think he thought that was the Freddy he created. Your interview with him in the film is just so fascinating to me. It just went so deep into his thought process and how the character of Nancy came and all of the influence through, you know, from his daughter mm -hmm. and how much, you know, of that came from his own life, having his mother you know, being this very strong woman who raised him and just, I don't know, I think it just in that sense, Nightmare on Elm Street is such a fascinating study, just in script writing, in uh, putting together stories from your own life and really tapping into the powerful undercurrents that everyone has, you know, all of the trauma that Nancy suffers and how she gets for that and all of the characters really, but she is the embodiment of that kind of whole process mm -hmm. is just amazing to me and Wes seems I mean he he really seems like he was a very extraordinary human with a really thoughtful touch he was such uh, an, an extraordinary yeah man in many many different ways his creativity was just out off the charts I mean what he came up with in his imagination but he was also a very you know deeply philosophical person who, you know, he actively went to listen to philosophers speak in New York City. And um, he would tell me about philosophers that he particularly liked, like Gurdjieff was one that he had, had um, you know, gone to 
visit. And so he wasn't just, uh, you know, wanting to be a Hollywood screenwriter and director. I mean, he had a lot of other things going on in his brain. And um, I think that sometimes I don't even know he knew what he created until later when he was able to really like analyze like what just came out of him. You know, I think mm -hmm. that when we were making it, we didn't have as deep a discussion as we did 25 years later when I sat down with him and he had had a chance to really understand the places that those ideas had come from. I think when we worked together, when we were young, he knew that he was just making a movie and, and I don't think he even knew what had bubbled out of him. <laughs> yeah, sometimes that's the way creativity happens, especially I feel for very intuitive creative people. Yeah. Yeah, it just comes to the surface in some magnificent way. And then you just realize, oh, that happened. <laughs> and that came from that. Um, you know, even talking about horror, personally, I'm not a big horror buff. And I believe this is something that we discussed at another time is that neither of us are really big fans <laughs> that some of the images really stay with us and continue to haunt us. I'm much the same way, but I can really appreciate the genre for the the themes that it raises. Mm -hmm. And I'm also so excited to talk to you tonight, you know, not just to Nancy, but to Heather <laughs> Lankenkamp. You've had such a lengthy career in film doing all sorts of things. And with AFX, you know, you're an award winning, Oscar winning special effects studio with makeup and developing all of these amazing characters. So I'm just a really long lead up into a question that um, Sergei is asking mm -hmm. is that I think A Nightmare on Elm Street is the only horror movie I have watched. Is, is, are those types of movies popular now? And Heather, you've, I mean, you've worked quite a lot in that genre. Would you say that horror is having a true resurgence these days? I think, I mean, of course, horror has never been more popular than it is today. I believe that because um, I feel like the, the world offers us so much horror that watching horror is, it's kind of like controlled horror. Whereas when you're watching the evening news, it's this chaotic horror that you don't even know where to go and don't know how to turn away from. But there's something that my friends who love horror just tell me, to know you're gonna sit down for an hour and a half and just be scared out of your mind and then you know you can stand up and walk away from it, it's really enjoyable. And um, people absolutely love it. Like we perhaps, Lucy, you and I, don't love it for other reasons. I think some people have imaginations that can't, they can't compartmentalize it well enough mm -hmm. so that they don't, it doesn't seep into their dreams or their fears of, uh, in real life. So um, I think for kids, especially who haven't grown up yet, some horror movies really scar them, you know. Um, I know a lot of people who will never take a bath again because Nancy's bathtub scene that is so horrifying. So um, it's it's very popular. It's very lucrative in this, in this, you know, Hollywood environment because horror movies are not that expensive to make. They don't, require a lot of, I mean, nowadays they have more special effects and that's more expensive, but the movie that we made was $1.3 million. And back then that was very, it was a pretty low budget and yet everything was done practically and it's very scary. So people try to do things in more creative ways in horror movies. They try new things that mainstream movies would never try. Uh, they get away with more violence. So people like them. I would tell Sergey that it's fine that you've only watched Nightmare on Elm Street, <laughs> but you could dip your toe in and watch. There are some other really wonderful horror movies out there that even even I enjoy. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there are. <laughs> um, we're, we're getting some really lovely comments uh, from Calvin as well, that Heather and Nancy is my favorite ultimate girl. Calvin ah. is watching us from Italy, so. Thank Italy. you, Calvin. <laughs> well, I, I actually am about to embark upon making a sequel to I Am Nancy. This is my, I am announcing this for the first time right now, but I decided that I wanted to honor all of my foreign fans in a way that was slightly different. And what I hear from my Italian fans especially is that 
the girl who who played me and who did my voice in the dubbing of you know you have to realize all over the world yeah people are hearing another woman deliver my lines and so even though they've seen my face my voice is often you you know new to them because they see Nancy with another voice entirely and i think um my my plan is to go around the world and actually interview the women who played Nancy because i think that they are really instrumental in my success in this character around the world because you know so much in acting is your voice and is your scream and is the way you face freddie in those quiet moments so that's what i'm wanting to embark on going forward so um my sequel i think will involve the the, the woman in italy the woman in germany the woman in france the woman in the uh maybe china even or japan who were the women who voiced my character. Wow, that's that sounds like an incredible project, really. Um, we're gonna try to help you find the woman who did that here in Ukraine. That will be my first stop. That would be fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> also, I just wanted to say, Heather, you know, I mean, Heather has been a part of you for more than half of your life. At, I know. At, at this point. And I mean, I think we've all heard about these actors that kind of get, they get very strongly associated with a specific character and sometimes so strongly that they kind of, they stop wanting to talk about their character. It's kind of a no go. And I have to say you have, you know, you have carried Nancy's legacy so graciously and probably the only question that you're probably more tired of it of, <laughs> at this point is, do you get tired of it, you know? Well, I think the one question that I get asked so often and, and it just becomes like really not tiring, but just, you know, it's so obvious, like what was it like to work with Robert England? I mean, it was fantastic. I mean, there's nothing more I can say. We made an incredible movie together and, and uh, I think people are always really curious about, you know, Freddy Krueger. So mm -hmm. I do have a lot of, uh, you know, I don't get impatient because I really feel at the end of the day that I've been so fortunate to have played such a character. Like very few women mm -hmm. in the history of film have played a woman who not only grows up, you know, from a teenager to a, a young woman to a mother in three different, very different movies. I, you know, I got to work with Wes Craven and Robert England. So I just, I, it would be like if you, you just had the most fortunate thing land in your in your lap and you are just constantly grateful for it and i i just love nancy myself a lot if it was a character that i didn't love as much as i do it might be more difficult i understand she's very easy to love and yeah. to admire so yeah. Oh, we have so many. We have so many people yeah, listening. Yeah. Okay. Oh, on a roll. So, so Heather, what do you think of Nancy's death in the film? Uh, Are you allowed to talk about that? <laughs> yeah. So the when I die in when Nancy, Nancy Thompson dies in uh, the third movie, it's called Dream Warriors. At the time, I really felt it was necessary to have an ultimate sacrifice for these kids to actually it would launch her into this place of, she would just be so beloved. I just knew that when you have a character that dies for others in any movie, you just automatically feel like they've given everything they could to save somebody. And that's exactly her nature. That's exactly who she was as a person. She would do anything to save her friends. And in the first movie, it just so happens that she's the last one standing but she you know i think i think it's just the one extra step she, they they could take her to make her even better than she already was and you know a lot of people tell me that they cried when that happened and i you know that's what you're supposed to do you know and that's it's a very hard thing to face death obviously but she was transformed in that in that scene to something that was even more spectacular than the characters he played. Oh my gosh! Look at, look at yeah, look at, 
I and love it. a question from Ashton. What was your favorite scene to make in the movie to shoot? So behind the scenes. Well, there's like the scene that turned out the best mm -hmm. when I when I wasn't sure that it would is definitely the bathtub scene. I didn't know what the heck we were doing <laughs> when we were <laughs> shooting that scene, and uh, it was really um, there's a. There's actually a, a show on Netflix right now called The Movies That Made Us. And you actually see behind the scenes exactly how they made it. And it's so instructive to people because the special effects um, coordinator was literally in the water between my legs with a, Fred, with a scuba suit on and a Freddy <laughs> glove on his hand. And it people just don't understand how that scene was made until I think this this TV, this documentary on TV. Um, mm -hmm. But that scene turned out so well and it's now my favorite scene. Um, I think there's so much, it's such a simple scene. It's a little a, a girl singing a nursery rhyme in the bathtub, you know, and just relaxing and trying to forget. And, and then this horrible thing happens and, you know, she slips into her dream again and is terrorized by Freddie. So that's probably my favorite scene. Um, Later on, when we did Nightmare on Elm Street 7, Wes Craven's new nightmare, mm -hmm. I have to say my favorite scene in that movie was in the dungeon when I, I fall out of the kind of sky into this, swim, like this pool of water. And then I have to wander around this magnificent dungeon and I get to fight Freddy, you know, hand to hand combat. And I get to like hit him with a, like a big candelabra and I, you know, I think that is one. Of, that's my second favorite scene. I, I like shove an eel into his eye, and then I yeah. hit him with a candelabra. It's like a really physical fight, and I loved. I always love fighting with Freddie. Heather, um, I'm of the personal belief that Home Alone was very influenced <laughs> by Nancy. I mean, just the ingenuity that she yeah. shows in, tra in setting all of these traps and using all of these right. things for, I mean, definitely 100%. Four years later, boom, home alone. You're right. I mean, people, I mean, how many times have you wondered if those things really work? And I, I think that I know Wes Craven did have a copy of the Army manual called Improvised, in, Improvised Anti-Personnel Devices. I, that was a real book I guess they distributed to soldiers in mm -hmm. this maybe in whatever wars they you know they would have this little manual about how to get out of a tough spot and mm -hmm. that all of those are in that book for real I think <laughs> I mean it's astounding how much iconic imagery that Nightmare on Elm Street really generated you see the house yeah it's so immediately recognizable. You see Freddy, the bathroom scene. I mean, so mm -hmm. much of it is just embedded into popular culture and even modern popular culture, which is, again, amazing because, you know, this happened in 1984, way before the internet. And right. it's, it's just so persistent. And I guess my question is, was kind of that experience um, instrumental in leading you further to actually work in special effects? Actually, it was more of an accident. Um, so I, you know, I went to a rap party for uh, one of Wes Craven's other films that was called Serpent and the Rainbow. And I went to that rap party and was introduced to David Anderson. And, you know, we fell in love and we got married and uh, we had kids. And it didn't really occur to me that I would ever, you know, do what he does. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not interested in doing makeup. I, I don't really care about it. I really admired watching him work. And, um, you know, he's so good at what he does. And then, um, you know, and he worked for people like Rick Baker and did um, Nutty Professor and Men in Black when he won Academy Awards for those two films. And then he decided he wanted to go into business for himself. And, and he joined his father in a, in a studio. And they worked on a lot of movies together. And as, as he started doing that with his father, and I know that there was a picture of his dad in one of the pictures in the slides. Um, mm -hmm. they, there was, you know, there was downtime for me because I didn't have a lot of work when I was in my thirties. I mean, in fact, I had a really, really pretty serious dry period between like the ages of 
I'd say like 34 and 54, really. I mean, like I didn't have that many auditions. I didn't get any parts. And so I said, you know, I, I, I love helping out and I'll just help out. And, and so in the beginning, I just kind of helped out on days that were tough. And then I later became more of a producer and started managing the budgets and helping hire our crew and managing their time and buying, you know, re sourcing out the materials that we were using. And so I became like more of this coordinator at the shop. And, and that became something that I really enjoyed and it allowed me to be home with the kids every day and pick them up from school. And when David did go to location, we could all go together. And so that's why I, it kind of became out of necessity, this really great job. And so now, now that we've been doing it together for 25 years, um, I was like, I, I, I sometimes think, oh, maybe this isn't what he wants to do anymore too. Like maybe I should, you know, and I have recently gone back to work as an actor and I thought, you know, maybe things will, maybe will change now. Maybe we'll do less makeup effects jobs and maybe I'll get more acting work. So it just mm -hmm. will depend. We try to, you know, we try to go with the flow, however it works out best. Yeah. I actually had a question at the very beginning. Uh, if you were planning on working on any short short films, and I think the commenter said that Washed Out was a was a huge favorite. Yeah. So yeah, I made. Um, well, um, my son Atticus uh, died of brain cancer almost three years ago, and I made a short film in honor of him, just to talk about grief and you know horror movies have so much death. Um, so horror movies have so much death in them, but they never really, really deal with grief. I mean, very, very mm -hmm. rarely. And so I decided I'm going to make like a little tiny kind of a horror movie, but it's really going to be about, de you know, grief and, oh, sorry, I'm getting a phone call. Let me turn this off. Um, and so I, I got my friends together and got a, a camera and my daughter ended up helping be the cinematographer as well. And I made a short film that I really enjoyed making. And I, yes, really want to make another film. So I am uh, I do have a story in mind that I'd like to do. And it's just a matter of kind of getting all the the pieces together at this point. But mm -hmm. uh, short, short films are just labors of love. You know, you just do them because you really want to make a statement about something. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's incredible. So Jake, you can keep an eye out for that. And I will definitely, will try to seek out Washed Away. I'm so intrigued. Yeah, we're getting some questions about your work on the Netflix show. And actually, I have some pictures from your work at AFX that I think we could show just for everyone mm. to get a sense of what you do at your other yeah. job while you talk about what's coming up on Netflix. Uh, so that picture, it's kind of hard to see, but on that in that picture, I'm working on Star Trek Into Darkness. And um, I worked as a puppeteer on that, uh, on that day because if a puppeteer requires this... Uh, a union actor to actually puppeteer the pr puppet. And, and this scene, it's a tale of this girl. And it actually didn't end up in the, well, it, I think it did end up in the movie, but they they ended up using a different uh, tale sequence. So whenever they need a puppeteer, I have sometimes put myself in there to operate, <laughs> to operate them. And it's really fun because you get to be on set all day long and, you know, you manage these little, they're like little puppets that that one was, um, yeah, just a big, gigantic, long tail that had to like move back and forth. Yeah. Uh, that's my husband, David Anderson. He's making um, this the ballerina girl in uh, Cabin in the Woods. He's doing, that's the, the picture on the left. And then on the right, he's working on a character from Star Trek Into Darkness. And those are more Star Trek photos. So the man on the right with the white hair, that is my father-in-law, Lance Anderson, who really founded our business in 1979. He he had been a union electrician here in Los Angeles and decided to go to Elegance School of Makeup. And this was when he was maybe 40 and he just wanted to change his career. And he became a very, very important makeup artist um, here in Los Angeles. And so w the building that we occupy now is the building that he had bought when he was just starting in the makeup effects world. That's incredible. And who is this? <laughs> so this is this is Moto. So this is a character I played in Star Trek. We had um, we had made a character for a movie 
uh, it was a science fiction movie that, that got, you know, canceled right at the last minute. And we had already made a bunch of really beautiful aliens. And this alien was one that had been made based on my life cast and my face. And, and so we were looking for some other characters we could put into Star Trek Into Darkness. And um, no one really owned this makeup anymore. And so David and I suggested to JJ Abrams, like, let's, we have one more alien that we could use in this scene, except the only thing is that Heather has to wear it because it's made for her face. <laughs> And so he was like, sure, let's have it, you know. So I was uh, really excited because I wanted to wear the Star Trek outfit. <laughs> and, uh, and more than anything, just being on the set of Star Trek was so thrilling. And so that makeup took five hours to apply. And I, um, I sat there and, you know, unfortunately, it's not really in the movie very much. But mm -hmm. for me, it was a really great life experience. Gosh, looks so exciting. And what are you doing with Netflix these days? So uh, Mike Flanagan, who is a uh, you know, really popular director and producer on Netflix right now, he has been a big fan of Nightmare on Elm Street. And I didn't really know it until this last January where his casting agent called and asked if I would audition for a part on his newest show called The Midnight Club, which is a show um, that was gonna shoot in Vancouver during COVID. So, it involved moving up to Vancouver and doing a lot of quarantining and uh, very severe COVID protocols on the set. But I play a wonderful character. I play um, a doctor who owns a hospice for teenagers with uh, terminal cancer. And so the whole cast are young people, really great actors. Iman Benson plays our lead and she is a you know, cancer a victim of you know, cat. Uh, I think thyroid cancer, she's dying. And at midnight, all these kids who have this pretty grim, you know, life really, um, they get together and tell scary stories around the fire. And it's a beautiful show because at these stories that they tell, we, you know, they get acted out in, you know, in a dramatic fashion. And so my, my character actually appears in a lot of the stories as other characters. And mm -hmm. so as an actor, I got to play four different characters over the course of this season. And they're all very, very different. And they all have different makeup, they have different wigs. And, and so you'll see that my character plays um, all sorts of people. And I can't wait till it comes out though. I have absolutely no idea when the air date is. I'm praying it's sooner rather than later, but I have no, uh, no news about that. That's so exciting. I will definitely be on the lookout for that. And I also heard that you're doing a new project with, with Guillermo del Toro very soon. I would, as so, a <laughs> yeah, so um, David uh, is now working on, um, yes, an episode of Guillermo del Toro's newest uh, television show called uh, Cabinet of Curiosities. So that should be out. It's probably going to be out, I would imagine, in the spring sometime. But that's very exciting. Apparently, though I'm not 100% sure, for every episode of this TV series, a different makeup effects house is doing the makeup effects. So uh, we finally got our turn, and we're really excited about it. No, that's, you know, I just love hearing about all of the different things that you've been doing over the years. And I'm actually so happy that we're getting such an influx of kind of strong female characters. You know, we've had Big Little Lies, The Undoing, yeah. and um, I really hope that we get the chance to see you in a lot more films because oh, that would be so wonderful for all oh, of us. <laughs> thank you, that's very nice to hear. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. And uh, I always had a sense when, you know, when you're raising your family, Sometimes you feel frustrated that you're not able to, you know, work as much as you would like. But I always had a, a sense in my gut that, you know, this time of my life when I was an older woman, that I would be able to go back to acting. And, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed that that's going to be able to happen. Yeah. You've been, you know, on different sides um, and in different sectors of the film industry for so many years. And you've been so successful in so so many areas 
my question is, you know, how do you build kind of a sustainable career and what does it take to really work with these, you know, directors of the highest caliber, Guillermo del Toro, J.J. Abrams? Like, is there, is there any wisdom you can pass on to just young people that are building their careers now in any sector? I mean, I honestly, I mean, my, I feel like my husband is the one who has given me the, the biggest, um, like insight into this uh, exact question that you're asking. Mm -hmm. A lot of it has to do with, you know, your integrity and your honesty and your, I mean, your talent at the end of the day. I mean, you have to have some talent. And if you do have talent, then you, you know, you, you have to always, you know, improve it and be the best that you can possibly be and, know what's required and always be a you know honest dealer i think that you always feel that the hollywood stereotype are these people who you know are making deals and wheeling and dealing and there's this fast-paced kind of um i don't know business environment and it is like that definitely but on the flip side of it is that these are real artists like people who really know what they they're doing and they really take it extremely seriously and they they know that they just have to put a hundred and ten percent into everything that they do and dot every i and cross every t and be on top of it and don't don't be lazy just you just can't be lazy at at any moment and if if there's anything that i've learned from my own career is that you know, sitting back and not being aggressive enough is also sometimes a, a disadvantage. Like I think for myself, I often wasn't as persistent as I needed to be or um, demanding as I needed to be towards people who, you know, I, I was depending on. And over time in retrospect, you know, that's something that you have to have a certain amount of not just um like oh I don't want to say aggression but you have to be very ambitious you have to have that part of you and it has to be um an ambition that is polite and you know mm -hmm. and forthright but also very you know persistent it's persistence i think that in fact my in my house i have a a, a kind of a a needle point you know uh like uh -huh. uh, in a frame that says persistence. It's the only thing that can get you where you want to go. And it's true. Wow. Thank you. That's so. And it's also, you know, doing things, doing things uh, that you believe in that might not be very lucrative or just mm -hmm. like helping a friend who needs your help. That person might pay you back later in ways that you didn't, didn't know were possible and banding together with other artists that have the same kinds of vision as you do. I think that's also, you need that mm -hmm. support. Yeah, community and just working with yeah. people that are on a same wavelength, that's so yeah. important. Yeah, we're getting so many great questions from everyone and we're almost out of time. So um, just Let's wanted see. to encapsulate some of the ones, oh, Maybe one from Garcia. Do you know, is it true that Tim Burton offered a character to you? No, I can say that's not true. False, I, unfortunately. False. <laughs> Let's see if there's any other question. Oh, uh, then Melissa Gilbert was one of my inspirations. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I have to say that she definitely, I admired her so much growing up. That show was on when I was a young girl. And that character is very similar to Nancy when you really think about it. I mean, she's really, have you seen this show, Little House on the Prairie? It's no, um, really, I think this is a complete cultural uh, blackout here in Ukraine. Can you tell us a little bit about the, 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 the books were written about a family that um, gets in a covered wagon and crosses the United States in probably 1850, perhaps across the plains of, of Missouri and Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And, there's eight, seven, no, maybe nine books, but Laura Ingalls Wilder is the author and she actually lived 
you know, this life um, as a girl. And it's it's very difficult life. I mean, they have to build their own house. They have to, you know, uh, deal with starvation and cold and all of these things. And that this is a little family, you know, and they're making their way on the prairie. They televised, they made a television series out of it in the in the 70s. And I just had to watch it every day. And that character, she was so strong. She could do anything. She was like really tough. And she had a sister who was blind. So she had to be very like accommodating and helpful in her family. But also just, she was kind of a troublemaker at times. But I really feel like <laughs> if I have any, probably Nancy, my Nancy is very, uh, you know, sprung from that character that uh, Melissa Gilbert created. Yeah, there's, uh, I think, something, a common thread in all strong female characters, but it's so interesting that you, you've, you know, chosen this one from this, again, very iconic kind of American time period that really... Well, and, it, and, and it, you know, America has this great uh, need to uh, make that period look very, glam not glamorous, but very noble and mm -hmm. you know the strength of these people to get across the country but there was you know it accompanied incredible suffering on the parts of of course you know our indigenous people and you know some of the people died along the way it was very you know it was very uncertain what would happen to you if you took this journey so that show really kind of washed over a lot of the real issues that of course as an adult we've come to understand but for a child that noble idea that you would find a new place to live and mm -hmm. just by your wits and by your strength and kept banding together i think it was a very american show it'd be very interesting for the you know to see it in ukraine and what people would think of it um yeah maybe maybe one of your evening movie nights you could show a <laughs> yeah, we could definitely consider that. I mean, Little House on the Prairie, wow. But, you know, I was just listening to you talk and I thought, wow, they really chose the perfect person for Nancy. I think that you had all of these um, already inspirations inside you with Melissa and had a very clear vision of who Nancy would be. And I think that, you know, the, again, the persisting allure of Nightmare on Elm Street, of course, Freddie is a very, very important guy. He's, he's very memorable, but I think <laughs> that the core of it is Nancy and the way she, oh. you know everything is just drawn through it. And I think it's so important that you did this film really about her. And I'm so excited to see you revisit this subject and see where it is. Thank you. <laughs> Me too. I The thing about making a documentary, which is so, it's just the best part, is that you, you embark on your journey thinking one thing and then you leave with a totally different idea of what you're going to actually make because people people are better than your imagination, what they're going to say and how they're going to be. And so I, now that I know that, I'm even more excited about starting, you know, it, uh, this new adventure. Well, Heather, I hope that we will see you in Ukraine very soon and that we will have the opportunity to screen um, I Am Nancy here in <laughs> Kiev as well very soon. And I hope so. Together, yes. Well, I want and to thank all the people who tuned into that live stream. This is the first time I've ever done a live stream oh. and it's been really exciting. And there's so many wonderful people out there. Um, I just don't, I, I wish I could answer all these questions, but maybe what I could do is in the YouTube feed, maybe I can answer some of them. Oh, if, that would uh, be exciting, I think, for everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Heather. It was, uh, wow, it's an honor for us to also host your first live. So exciting. Yay, thank you, America House. And I can't wait to come to Kiev and uh, meet all of you in person. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to everyone who was who joined us virtually. Um, Halloween weekend is upon us. So have fun, but stay safe and take you care of yourself. And if you can, take care of someone else too. And, and Freddie says, goodbye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. And see you very soon. Thanks, Heather. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween.